Fred Loving, Dutch media theorist, internet critic and founder of the Institute of Network Cultures, will discuss the dark side of the net in his lecture Stuck on the Platform, the Networked Psyche Inside Outside. It will zoom in on the widespread techno sadness that is produced by dominant social media platforms through behavioral modification. For loving, instead of empowerment and diversity, we witness an effect of hyperconformism resulting in anger, sadness, depression, and loneliness. To fight against this flow, loving will propose us some alternatives to discuss. Is a return to decentralized networks possible? And if so, is it desirable? Okay. Well, amazing to be here. Uh, for many of you, um, probably the first time uh, again after one and a half years. Um, hidden behind the screens, um, so it's exciting and I'm going to present new work, it's based on Tristesse por Desenio, uh, here uh, you have the, the book, uh, published by Consoni in uh, Bilbao, um, and it was published late uh, 2019, uh, while we were planning uh, you know, a, a, a book tour through uh, Spain, also Barcelona and many other places. And yeah, this uh, could not happen. But hey, here I am again. <laughs> and so it's amazing uh, to uh, be, be back here and to discuss, uh, you know, really um, in a very advanced uh, and strategic uh, way uh, the questions uh, you know that uh, we just heard are uh, on the table. Um, it's a mixture, let's say, between platform theory and um, the question of um, the mental state that these platforms uh, produce. enhance and even you know conspire so these are not uh, accidental um, states of mind uh, there's a whole uh, idea uh, behind behind this so let's uh, go directly for an update uh, of uh, September 2021 and discuss uh, the current situation and what's to be done. The lecture is called Stuck on the Platform. During the 2021 lockdown misere, we've literally been stuck on the platform. What happens when your home office starts to feel like a call center and you're too tired to close down Facebook. How to get rid of your phone? Wrong answers only. Instead of a radical techno imagination that is focused on the rollout of alternatives, we got distracted by fake news, cyber warfare, and a never ending barrage of statistics, including conflicting interpretations. The topic under discussion here is what happens to the psychocultural condition when there's nowhere else to go and users are trapped in too big to fail IT firms. While some believe the never ending resentment, complaints and anger are all too human noise factors unrelated to the shape and size of the information ecology. Others, like me, are convinced that we have to take uh, the mental poverty of the online billions serious. This is why uh, I'm here in, during this lecture 
where, um, you know, to say it with uh, Donna Haraway, we're staying with the trouble called internet and continue to dig deeper into the current stagnation phase. How to de-platform platforms? I think that's the central question. As you and I are not able to resolve this, we remain glued to the same old apps, furious at others about our own inability to change. The Brexit, Trump and COVID period of 19 to 21, the last, basically last two, three years, can be characterized by both stasis and crisis, with the old rejecting to die and the new refusing to be born. While managers preferred safely and safety and control over change and positive PR spin over criticism, internet complacency set in. The COVID-induced restrictions combined complacency and comfort for some with mass despair, loneliness, and a health crisis on an unprecedented scale for the many, even further accelerating existing inequalities. Working from holes in sanitized, gentrified areas, the overall feeling was one of numbness. During lockdown, the omnipresent internet became the stage of intense interiority, with the home becoming the center of modern life. With the kitchen turned into a classroom and the bedroom turned into a shopping mall, workplace, restaurant and place of entertainment all at once. I quote Orwell here, all revolutions are failures, but they are not all the same failures. This is also the case for the digital revolution. We've come to the point where we need to overcome disappointment and start to see platforms as disciplinary machines in line with, of course, Michel Foucault, in line with the clinic, the school, the factory, and the jail. We should no longer be surprised that this power uh, is a repressive one and not just depressive. Of course, Foucault would uh, add there productive, but yes, yes, we are uh, productive, of course. There's even more productivity under COVID than before. Surprise. By facilitating the social in a free and smooth way, power relations are being informed, formatted, formed, yet the appropriate concepts that explain what's really going on are still missing, right? So we're tapping a little bit in the dark when it comes to the precise uh, power and seductive element in the whole platform story. Uh, why don't we move on? Okay, it's not exactly a panopticon, and I think this is where, you know, we need to f dig deeper, maybe also confront uh, the, uh, you know, the surveillance uh, motive that is uh, so dominant in many of the conspiracy theories that uh, make the rounds uh, these days. So there's a real task for us there. But then we really miss the point and uh, we, we get sucked into these conspiracy theories themselves yeah? and with all their vulgar economicism, un economicism and straight out anti-Semitism. The orchestrated neglect of decades to take the internet, internet seriously is now boomeranging, leading to a conceptual poverty that wouldn't be so bad after all 
if it was not for the fact that over five billion people depend on this infrastructure. So now I'm going a bit deeper in. Let's dive then into the social media weariness, the cause of our tired eyes. What are the techniques of resignation that we are exposed to? The blissful ignorance after browsing an entire ecosystem of narratives is not surprising. Distraction equals exhaustion. Culture is a pendulum and the pendulum is swaying. The organized optimism hard-coded in online advertisements and other forms of algorithmic advice, turned out to be merely producing anxiety. I quote, What can't be cured must be endured. Caroline calls Richard. The suffering, sorrow and misery is getting tagged and filtered by our own self-censorship. We've been captured and feel frozen in this trauma scape. Adapting a phrase from Emile Cioran, we could say that no one finds in social media that which was lost in life. Unfulfilled desires in order not to die extinguish themselves in the messages. Internet, experience like this, is the cemetery of the soul. What we do receive is the anger of the online others. As there is no way to run off, sublimate, freely serve and wander. The growing imbalance of digital enchantment is neither causing a revolution or revolt, nor does it fade out. Welcome to the great stagnation. We, the online billions, are stuck on the platform. Once we're locked in, the path to in infinity has been blocked. Instead, we're caught in a Truman Show-like repetition of the perpetual now toiling around in the micro-mess of online others that try to do their best, masking their failures and despair, like everyone else. Franco Berardi observes the mental state of today's students. I see them from my window, lonely, watching the screens of their smartphones, nervously rushing to classes, sadly going back to the expensive rooms that their families are renting for them. I feel their gloom. I feel the aggressiveness latent in their depression. So this is how Berardi describes the situation. In the social media era, the Oblomov position is no longer an option, in particular for those that cannot economically afford to get stuck in the abyss. We experience the sadness of online existentialism minus the absurdity. So we know surrealism for you, right? This, this, is the, this is the problem. If only you know, social media were overnight turning into surreal uh, environments, right? That would be fantastic. Unfortunately, this is not happening. If only Robert Faller's notion of interpassivity was ever really implemented in code, instead of yet being another Austrian idea. We would indulge in a permanent state of indolent apathy. Instead, there's nothing passive about human-machine interactions. 
We, the streaming egos, click, scroll, and swipe, obsessed with self-creation. We see no alternative options. Being unsocial, as it is called in Italy, being unsocial, the Zen status of detachment, is an ontological impossibility. We're never really lurking. Our presence is always noted, and we can therefore never truly enjoy the secretive wire status. Interaction is our tragic existence. Instead, we're constantly asked to upgrade, fill in form, forms, and rank our taxi drivers. You're engaged. You're engaged and feel enraged, but still retreat in your safe rabbit hole. When you're feeling tired and nothing seems helpful, you've reached the end of the downward spiral. You ignore the, the signs and will pay dearly, but for now, nothing matters much. What happens when your social graph fail, falls flat and you have nothing to talk about? You forget to like and follow and no longer respond to text. The networks around you collapse, but you feel incapable to act. Is this the joy of missing out? The epic shit of others no longer impresses. The perfectionism has killed you and now you are face to face with an empty bucket list. Ducking tired, bored with Reddit, Facebook and Instagram and nowhere else to go. It's damn sure you've lost interest in everything you were once passionate about. Here we are arrive at the stage that uh, our late Bernard Stiegler ca characterized as symbolic misery. Driven by cognitive downgrading, this is a condition that, according to Stiegler, can be traced back to the launch of the web in 1993, leading to a new stage of what he calls proletarianization, turning us into a new proletariat, which he also described as an era, era of symbolic stupidity due to automatic de de decision making. The resulting stupor is caused by a series of technological shocks brought onto the four GAFA horsemen of Aufklärung, as he calls them. This is my reading of the second in his series of Nanjing lectures that came out last year, the year he died. The result of this is the internet blues as he called it, suffered by those who believed in the promises of the digital era, of course, including uh, Bernard's friends at Ars Industrialis and myself. This results in a growing inability to retain insights, leading to a loss of the capacity to theorize in favor of externally stored data-driven knowledge, a state in which understanding has been automated as analytical power that has been delegated to algorithms. And this was a quote of him. This is the process of outsourcing of objective memory or tertiary retention, as Stiegler called it. What early craftsmen turned factory workers in the 19th century experienced, namely the loss of skills, is eventually experienced by all professions. The destruction 
of all knowledge that results from what Stiegler calls exterritorialization. For Stiegler, this is not a given, a fatal development. The turn here, uh, the Kiera or Bende, uh, this Heideggerian notion, the turn is provided by the idea of the pharmacon. The digital for us is both poison and medicine, leading to a new episteme or epistemology, which uh, Stiegler called digital studies, which I'm trying to contribute to here. Holding the promise what, of what Stiegler called a new epoch. How to reverse the depletion of resources. From a strategic point of view, the question then becomes how to create an alternative to the automated herds and artificial crowds. What forms of social can take up and uh, take the task of care here? So it's, it's about the design of new forms or new formations of the social, right? Uh, so in the, in the 90s, you remember, this was called uh, the virtual community, and then we had the blogs, and yeah, these are forms of social, or to be more precise, formations of the techno-social, right? And what our task is to imagine a new forms of the social, which in our epoch is the techno-social. How can we escape the pitiful misery of the individualized fate, overcome the compulsive defense mechanism of the subject as monad, escape the identity jails, and design new forms uh, of being together, cooperation and forms of the social that are truly 21st century, right? And at the moment, the problem here is that we cannot imagine a social uh, beyond the social media, right? And th this is a problem we need to crack. Hmm? Platforms are, uh, play a very important role here because this, this social is, is captured and, and is uh, um, jailed, confined uh, on the platform. This is the problem. The platforms do not merely monopolize markets. They own and shape them. While the rest of the economy stagnates and central banks fuel the stock market, big tech accumulates profits at unprecedented rates, buying back their own shares instead of doing productive investments. We thus end up with an internet that exponentially speeds up economic uh, and social inequality. I'm starting to feel like a stripping, uh, stripper dancing on this, on this uh, sub-stack letter pole and everyone is cheering, but so few readers are actually making it rain, if you know what I mean, says Michel Luc, uh, sketching out the long and winding road from the free culture to a fair living wage for content producers and creators. While the last of the market pundits defend the, social, the status quo with the consumer choice arguments, users are coming to terms with their feudalist status. Uh, we need to read the platform user relation in the light of Hegel's master-slave dialectic. Once the social contract has locked uh, in the users, a combination of addiction and social conformism makes it impossible for users to freely leave the platform and go elsewhere. This is what, uh, what Yanis Varoufakis, in line with Johnny Dean and others, calls techno-feudalism. In a similar way, Bruce Schneider, uh, the crypto expert, spoke about feudal security offered by big tech 
in which users surrender their autonomy by moving into a warlord's fortress and in return get protection from the bandits that roam the, band, the badlands without. In this situation is all we can hope for sporadic peasant revolts. Right? So that this is the kind of uh, analogy of the, let's say, the new Middle Ages that many decades ago, of course, uh, Umberto Eco spoke about and, um, you know, is still with us, at least as a motive, right? Hmm? So peasant revolts, right? Coming from Barcelona, yeah, is that uh, um, something we can speculate about? Where is the 21st century equivalent of the skilled, self-educated, and most of all, self-conscious worker that understands the need to get organized? All aspects of work has, has now been di digitized. Instead of conspiratorial uh, professional revolutionaries, we've left with do-good NGO workers on temporary contracts. This leaves us with the desire to leave behind the neo-feudal stage and fast forward to the classic early 20th century strategy question of revolution or reform, right? Rejection or adoption, abolition or civilization of the platform as form, right? So I've been playing around also a little bit with the platform, I don't know if, how it sounds in Spanish. If you can, you know, freely play around a bit with the flat form, flat form, yeah, so that, that's basically where the word comes from. It's a, it's a plane, even in the Deleuzean sense, yeah? but unfortunately uh, it's a plane that uh, is, has been conceived as a fortress. Yeah? So it's not, uh, um, anyway, so, the, so there are still some, let's say, linguistic or etymological possibilities um, to further think of our um, uh, jailed in uh, our captured hmm, imagination. For instance, also the idea of the plat formation so in, instead of the platform, which is static, we could have the platformation, which is pro maybe a little bit more dynamic. Who knows? You know, how can we bring some dynamic into this? This is my question here. This discussion, we, we sense, has yet to start to make up for the lost decade in which we failed to discuss alternatives and mindedly installed every app. On the Dutch uh, television, uh, Eugene Morozov, which you may know, correctly criticizes the digital feudalism thesis, not because it fails to describe the misery we're in, but because of its implicit linear thesis that we ought to progress back to capitalism. Right? So there's an, another uh, st stage there. Can we, for instance, jump? This is the question discussed now. Can we jump from digital feudalism to digital socialism? Now, according to the uh, development, hmm, this is not possible, right? But maybe it is. Look at uh, communist China. This is precisely what happened there. Uh, so um, we will see more of these debates, uh, I would say, uh, soon. Now I'm coming to an end. Key to get out is finding out forms of self-organization that work. How to organize in the shadow of the perpetual present without being bothered by filters, trolls, algorithms, secret services, and other automated authorities. How can we communicate and come together without having to entirely depend on offline encounters, right? Because 
this is the obvious um, only option that we have if we reject uh, the social media uh, and the platform, uh, the online platforms. Call it organized networks, right? This is the term um, I worked on for a long time now with my friend Ned Rossiter uh, in Sydney. Organized networks. Core networks of organizational units, cells with a purpose that consist of strong links operating in opposition to the extractive weak links logic of the friends of friends of friends platform. Organized networks that focus on common tasks that need to be done, not on updating uh, solitary users. Please liberate us, lonely, desperate souls. Refuse, walk away, not what's, hap what's new or what's happening, but what's to be done. Come together and plan the exodus. If the network is the memory of the event and the platform is the memory of the network, what's next? Thank you very much. Uh, now we are opening, we have maybe like 10 or 15 minutes to have a conversation with her uh, and we invite you everyone to uh, address questions for Gert. I just have an initial question because I have a lot of questions after your presentation but uh, just to open the debate but I think that uh, you start with something that I think that is interesting that this idea of how uh, can we imagine this notion of uh, the platform the platform how, how we can imagine this because I think that uh, the, the platform is, is shaping everything on the mm -hmm. social and I think that how uh, at the end of your presentation you point mm -hmm. some some directions but how we can uh, how we can see, how can uh, we imagine this deep platforming process? Yeah, uh, I hope by, by experimenting, uh, trying a lot of new things in many, many directions. Uh, because I fear a little bit also coming from my generation, I mean even being the director of the Institute of Network Cultures, that you know, the only possible way for us is, is to go back and c kind of preach some kind of uh, network nostalgia. Hmm? Uh, the nostalgia of uh, the decentralized uh, ry rhizomatic uh, uh, in crowds and uh, um, yeah. So I think this is not, not an, an option. So, uh, obviously, um, that also uh, includes uh, my in-between notion that I developed with NED of organized networks, because in the end, uh, they are also networks. Um, but, yeah, the, 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 the techno-social, I would say, uh, uh, is something that um, you know c can be um, can be uh, designed. So there's a huge task of activist artists, uh, you know, to create a new form of, of a radical imagination uh, and experimentation, and uh, you know, to start on a very um, small uh, scale, I would say. Um, but yeah. Neither the, the network nor the, the platform, eh, or the, the decentralized or the decentralized ones, are um, a very, very good uh, starting point uh, uh, at the moment, unfortunately. So, um, but, uh, you know, nothing is, uh, nothing is lost. I mean, uh, our imagination, uh, in, princip in principle, our collective uh, human imagination is uh, endless, right? So, 
I, I, I'm not in despair uh, at, that, at that point. Also, I'm very uh, conscious that because we're talking about code here and we're talking about the, the techno-social, this can be impl uh, implemented very fast. And if we can learn something from the whole social media saga is you know, that these changes can happen very fast, within months, within, remember, you know, in, in the past, we, we, we were able to migrate, we were able to exodus very, very fast, with literally with millions of people, right? So this is not, it's not impossible. And that's why I'm saying this task, this crisis of uh, the, 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 the big tech might be big, but it can be resolved in a few months' time. Hmm? In comparison, compare that to the climate crisis. Right? So it, it's really small in comparison to the really big tasks uh, we're, fra we're facing in the 21st century. And this is my real uh, source uh, of optimism. Uh, I'm, I'm not, okay, uh, we are stuck on the platform. This is very, very true. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, we can leave. Uh, Anytime <laughs> and uh, change very fast. So. Okay, uh, maybe there are some questions or comments. Um, thank you a lot for your intervention. Um, do you have? Policy proposals, because it seems that you, when you talk about solution, you, you, you say you have to create and there have to be bottom-up initiatives and so on. But that's, do you propose yeah, sure. intervention yeah. on political level to stay? Yeah, uh, can you give some examples? For sure. I, I do not believe in, uh, in uh, legislation that is led by lawyers. I do not believe that for the Facebook or Google question, there is a legal solution. So this, is, uh, this has been uh, a, a, you know, a path that a lot of people, especially in Brussels, uh, were thinking about. But there is, we have not seen any change in the last years or in decade. Huh? Uh, so I would say I would definitely, when it comes to policy, we have to exclude legal uh, re regulation. There is no other way. That is a, that is a done uh, thing. Uh, so th this, is, this is a problem. F Facebook will ignore any form of regulation. Uh, and there's already so many examples uh, of that, right? So I think the, the, the issue must be much more drastic. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, uh, at the moment, and th this is the problem, I can only think of World War III as the, as the, as the you know, um, most likely, uh, you know, context in which this uh, can happen, right? But you could also say that's a lack of uh, imagination on my side. Uh, but, um, yeah, so, of course, I, I am an advocate of alternatives, and this is what we've been doing a long time. Uh, we are making some progress on the, on the, le on the, uh, on the level of alternatives, and these are good things. So, according to the dynamics that we're familiar with, it's more likely that alternatives, for instance, completely take over than that lawyers in Brussels will make uh, a solution uh, on the level of uh, regulation. Okay, sorry about this. Thank, Thank you for your talk. Um, you mentioned that in passing, but I, I'm curious to, that perhaps you could elaborate a bit more about this. I, I'm curious to know what's the role we you to give to artists mm -hmm. in that crisis, because that's yeah. what mm, a lot of us are doing here. Yeah. Yeah, coming from, uh, you know, from the field of new media arts, uh, I traditionally have a lot of uh, 
expectations. Uh, also because I think the artists, uh, you know, can uh, address the issues much, much uh, broader uh, than anyone, anyone else. Um, also, when we look uh, at, uh, for instance, uh, academia, there's almost no role to play for universities, for instance, and um, even recently the Dutch um, uh, you know, platform society theorist, Jose van Dijk, she called on the Dutch universities to start to develop these social media alternatives. But there's no one, you know, uh, who, who can take up this task, right? Which department, you know, can, has coders, for instance, ready uh, to do this? This is a completely, um, yeah, it's, it's a very, uh, nice gesture, but universities are absolutely not able to, to do this. So we need to, look, uh, we need to look elsewhere. And then, yeah, we're looking at, still looking at the field of culture, artists, activists, designers, of course, coming from the Netherlands. Designers play an important role. Uh, yes, uh, all social media act alternatives so far that have been developed uh, usually had very bad graphic user interfaces, we know that. So there is a role to play there at the level of uh, design. But yeah, for me, designers are also artists, so yeah. But thanks for the question. It's a key one. Any other question? Thanks, Claret, for the talk. Um, if last century was the American century, this century is said to be the Chinese century. How do you view recent developments in China in terms of state control of the internet? And what are the implications for that for, for us here in Europe? Yeah, for a really long time, already in the 90s, uh, the Chinese Communist Party discovered uh, that the um, uh, internet was a realm that had to be uh, surveilled, contained. That's why there is this uh, now. By now, a bit, yeah, old, but still very uh, functional Chinese uh, firewall. And of course, since the whole platformization, this has, you know, been taken also on onto the level of every every app. Uh, so uh, the, uh, the the control and surveillance. Um, capacities uh, are unprecedented and uh, even lately maybe you heard one two weeks ago um, this uh, n there's a whole new set of, uh, of rules uh, uh, restricting for instance children uh, to play games and um, uh, algorithmic uh, regulations uh, as, th as they um, they call them um, now I, I think in China, uh, th this is all used to, uh, let's say, to civilize and domesticate uh, the Chinese uh, citizens, right? And yeah, some people say that this model can and will be exported, but there are not so many examples yet uh, for for that. So um, what what Europe can learn from it yeah that's a, that's a good uh, question because uh, on the one hand we want that technical technological sovereignty and this term has you know been discussed here in barcelona uh, a lot 
uh, we want that also for the for the uh, European uh, Union, uh, but we want a, a sovereignty minus the surveillance, <laughs> let's say. Uh, and yeah, that that's that's a battle, and we can have that battle here. Uh, I fear this battle cannot be fought out in China itself. So th this is uh, this is the this is the the real issue. We are still in a position here that we can fight and, and discuss this. Unfortunately, this is not uh, the case uh, in uh, in China. The problem uh, for us arises in particularly when those Chinese values. Uh, are being implemented in code, especially uh, in hardware. So that's why the Huawei uh, discussion, uh, the 5G discussion, uh, is so um, uh, important, right? But uh, yeah, that's simultaneously uh, happening and going on. But um, yeah, the question of the architecture of the platforms and the techno social, um, I hope we can still you know, separate <laughs> these things. Maybe that's naive. Maybe the Chinese have already, um, you know, infiltrated us so much and infiltrated me that I'm now a uh, uh, <laughs> making propaganda for the CCP. I'm not sure. I have to check. <laughs> but yeah, this is a problem, right? Because a lot of the people say that our critique of Silicon Valley is, is now uh, equal to the Chinese critique. I dispute that, but it's something we need to be aware of and certainly discuss, at least I, I openly discuss. We need to talk about that because the influence of China, especially on the soft power level, uh, is growing. It's growing by the day. Uh, so, um, and even within our circles, um, we need to be aware of that. There cannot be a soft power surveillance for me, but okay. You know, if you look at the, the COVID uh, app discussions, huh? well, they're precisely about that. So <laughs> in a way, these discussions have already arrived, if you ask me. Okay, thank you very much. I have uh, a last question there. Uh, you mentioned also the, the the idea of platform as a as a fortress. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that this is this is very clear in terms of expression that what represents in our times on, on mm -hmm. COVID also that, that the signification of platforms. But can we uh, imagine uh, a kind of other platforms with no capture, for example, of imagination and open yeah. other social yeah. process? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Free of forms, course, like, yeah, the free, like the free, yeah, something new because yeah, the know. open platform, for instance. Well, I I looked for 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 that uh, that term, for instance, nothing, right? So we we really, uh, even if you want to stick to the platform, uh, I mean, um, yeah, that's that's the question. There, are, I haven't really seen any uh, open open platforms, you know. The, I, I, I wouldn't... Uh, anyway, the problem there is, of course, also that um, platforms are now some kind of culture ideal. Right? So, so a lot of the students, first-year students uh, in art schools or design schools in, in IT, they all want to have their own platform, right? Now, we know that this is an illusion, right? There's only one Alibaba, there's only one Amazon, we cannot have thousands of them. But may, you know, maybe we can. Huh? Uh, this has not really been uh, discussed uh, a lot, you know. Can we pulverize these uh, large environments? Can we uh, get rid of this inherent tendency of, uh, of scale? Huh? to work um, uh, you know, where uh, you need to uh, immediately claim uh, a monopoly uh, status uh, because that's the only way you will get funding. Uh, the whole EU, uh, for instance, startup 
logic is, is one that is deeply, deeply Silicon Valley driven and presumes that uh, if you build a new platform, you are going to be uh, the new uh, Elon Musk or, um, you know, and the, so even the, even the startup logic, you know, needs to be the, the platforms uh, in a way. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure again to have you here. Thank you. And we invite you, everyone, to follow the next uh, presentations.